And uh, as you know, we're doing Jilla or Morton in other people's bands, and we're indebted to Keith Nibbles for the idea of this. And uh, it's a fascinating project to put together. Uh, we're going to open with um, one of the earliest collaborations, and it's Jilla or Morton with the New Orleans Rhythm Kings, and they recorded in the Jeanette Studios, Richmond, Indiana, in July of 1923. And uh, this was a racially mixed recording, which was, of course, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings were a white band, uh, Jelly was a Creole, a uh, very rare thing in those days. In fact, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings had already sacked their drummer uh, just before this recording, Frank Snyder, because he refused to play with um, a black musician at a jam session. Uh, so it's great that things have changed now. And, uh, but uh, um, of course they checked into the only decent hotel in Richmond, Indiana to make this recording. And um, when the band was there, um, the desk clerk looked Jelly up and down suspiciously. Yeah. And George Bruden, is the trombone player, had to pass him off and said, no, he's a Cuban. So that's all right, the hotel. So, uh, uh, how this session came about is explained by the fact that the New Orleans Rhythm Kings and uh, Jelly Roll Morton shared a publisher, um, the Melrose Brothers, and um, um, uh, Jelly went to Walter Melrose and said, how can I get some of my tunes recorded? And uh, Melrose said, go and talk to the New Orleans Rhythm Kings. So he met uh, Paul Marais, the cornet player, and uh, Leon Rapolo, the uh, clarinet player. They agreed to um, record a couple of things, uh, Mr. Jelly Lord and London Blues. And uh, they also uh, recorded Mile and Boat Joyce. Now, uh, Jelly is often uh, credited with writing that tune, but in fact it was written by um, the Marys and Rapolo and George Brunis, and they used to play in New Orleans as Gold Leaf Strut. But uh, Jelly uh, got on the composer credits because he added an introduction to the bridge passage, and characteristically he said uh, uh, that those were the best bits. Um, so we're going to play London Blues. This is
That was uh, London Blues, uh, otherwise known as the Shoe Shiners Drive. Thank you to Michael McQuay there, who's uh, leading us. Uh, uh, he'll be back later. And uh, another notable collaboration uh, was uh, with Wilton Crawley. Oh, thank you to Stefan as well. He's off. <laughs> Leaving in their droves. Um, now, Crawley was born in Virginia in 1900 and um, was a juggler and a contortionist and he used to uh, tie himself up in knots and uh, often with a kerosene, a lighted kerosene lamp, complete with chimney on his head and uh, he'd go along and playing the clarinet, making horrible noises on the clarinet at the same time. He was sort of like a one-man happening and uh, uh, he was... Um, a uh, big star in Chicago in the 1920s on Vaudeville and uh, he enjoyed a run on Broadway in 1928 for a year. Um, he toured Europe in the 1930s and um, uh, he was a big fan of uh, Judge Ron Morton's. Um, uh, Judge's agent said that uh, he would have um, it worked for $25 a week to play with Jelly. I'm not sure that Jelly would have had him in, in his band. But um, anyway, uh, the story behind this next number is that Crawley hired Jelly to put a band together for a recording session. Then Crawley went out and got drunk and forgot all about it. So uh, then he hired Louis Russell to put a band together and both bands turned up at the studio. And Jelly Ramon was absolutely furious and spent the whole two hours of the session apparently arguing with Crawley. And, uh, and Crawley said the records would sell because he was the star. And uh, Morton said, now listen, cockroach, he told me. <laughs> he said, uh, the, the, the piano solos I'm putting down here will sell these records. And he said, just tune up that poor instrument of yours and I'll show you how to master it. So uh, not, a good, uh, not a good start. And uh, they had to cancel the session and start again the next day. And Victor Records insisted that Morton Crawley paid for all the sessions. Uh, for, for all the musicians. Um, anyway, we're going to play a rather beautiful number now called The Futuristic Blues, and actually Crawley plays rather nicely on this, and uh, as Matthias here will show us. And uh, so perhaps he did take um, Jelly's advice and tune his clarinet up. <laughs>
we're going to uh, stay with Wilton Crawley, and uh, Stefan is going to join us now, and uh, he's going to be playing the part of Charlie Holmes, who of course was the alto player with the Louis Russell band. And uh, as I've explained, half the Louis Russell band turned up to make this recording. Um, well, temperamentally, uh, Wilton Crawley is what uh, I suppose uh, modern science would call hyperactive. And I think Victor Records' idea was that uh, Morton's presence would help keep him under control. Um, well, uh, apparently, according to one account, Morton was sitting down at the piano to sort of familiarise himself with the music for the session and get things underway. And he suddenly heard this strange noise coming from the clarinet. And he looked round, and there was Wooden Crawley tied up in knots, propelling himself across the floor, squawking away on the clarinet. Um, so uh, apparently after that, uh, uh, Morton's manager said that jelly just fell out and after that everything was in the spirit of hilarity. <laughs> so uh, um, we're going to play uh, a number allegedly written by Wooden Crawley and it's a thing called She Saves Her Sweetest Smiles For Me. And this would have been one of the most beautiful records in jazz had it not been for Crawley's presence. Um, but uh, I think um, maybe Matthias will play it slightly more musically. I don't know. Yes. We'll see what see what it comes up with. Yeah. Okay. another one credited to him and it comes from the same session as that tune in June 1930 and uh, Morton's hand is clearly discernible in the organization of these records. Um, it's basically a string of solos but he adds, adds nice little effects. Um, you will hear um, 
um, some lovely guitar work by Teddy Bunn, which uh, Jakob Bullberger here is uh, doing a great parody. <laughs> and uh, there's another nice solo there, and um, that's followed with some more um, Wood and Crawley, and then there's a duet between the trumpet and the alto saxophone, and then things get rather silly. Um, uh, uh, Wood and Crawley starts doing all the... Uh, um, the laughing noises on his clarinet, and uh, Red Allen on trumpet responds with some crying noises. Uh, and then order is restored by Jodoro Morton's rather beautiful um, and florid piano solo. So this is the new Crawley Blues. I'll just start this one. <laughs> set of numbers from New York in March of uh, 1928 and uh, Johnny Dunn was one of the perhaps first recognized jazz soloists in the early 20s um, and uh, until the, he was eclipsed really by Louis Armstrong and Johnny Ron Morton remembers him coming to Chicago from New York to cut Louis Armstrong and he arrived with this sort of yard long coach horn and Johnny Ron Morton said you can take that long thing back to Chicago because these boys have cut you to death. 
So, uh, uh, and I don't think Jolly was um, particularly proud of the records that he made with Dunn, although I think they're rather nice. Um, uh, there was um, a British uh, record collector called Kenneth Hulsizer who met Morton in the mid-30s and asked him about these uh, records, and, uh, and that's where these stories come from. So we're going to start with a tune now by Perry Bradford, and it's the thing called You Need Some Loving. And uh, there were some plunger breaks from Johnny Dunn in this, which sound like they've been scored by Morton. And the trombonist on the record is uh, Herb Fleming, who when interviewed by John Shorten had no recollection of being on this record at all. <laughs> Everybody seems to think it's him. And he plays very much like the white trombonist Myth Mole, of course, who was the main man in New York in the late 20s. So here we go with uh, You Need Some Loving. Bouchelle, who played both clarinet and alto sax, and 
he has an extraordinary career. He was born in 1902, and uh, in his long life, he died in 1991. Uh, he played with, um, well, the whole span of jazz from New Orleans to avant-garde. There weren't many people who could claim to have worked with Bunk Johnson and Fats Waller and Eric Dolphy and John Coltrane. And I think it was on a Gil Evans uh, record with Miles Davis. So, uh, amazing man. So, uh, and of course, we have the amazing Stefan. So, we're going to play um, a rather funny tune now. Um, and we're indebted to Keith Nichols for this arrangement. And it's called... Sergeant Dunn's bugle call. Take it away, Duke. <laughs> features a typical Morton effect. You hear this quite a lot in his records where the clarinet plays in the low register and he plays high up on the piano with some suspended chimes called. Uh, so you, you'll hear that line in Morton's music. So here is Ham and Eggs. <laughs> Thank you. 
a Johnny Dunn section uh, with a, a number called Buffalo Blues, and this uh, also had a, another title, um, Miss, Mr. Joe, and it was Joe, Joe DeRong's tribute to Joe <coughs> King Oliver. And this features some muted plunger work from Duke, and uh, it's a sort of general wah-wah effect across the front line. And uh, again, there are more chimes behind the clarinet solo. now and uh, he hadn't made a recording after um, October 1930 uh, Victor Records didn't renew his contract and uh, until he recorded again in 1938 and did those famous Library of Congress recordings with Alan Lomax um, <coughs> he, he hadn't made a record uh, at all and apart from this one it's, and, and this wasn't released at the time it was made for the ARC label and uh, it wasn't released until Columbia bought up the rights and issued it about seven years after Morton had died. So it didn't do it a lot of good, really. Um, four, four tunes were recorded, and Jelly played on two of them, and Teddy Wilson played on the other two. Uh, so it finds him in some rather sort of strange company for him. Uh, um, a lot of swing musicians, Bud Freeman, Artie Shaw, Dickie Wells on trombone, uh, Wing of of course. Um, John Hammond was the producer of the record, and um, he remembers at that time um, seeing Morton around New York, and he said he looked very seedy and disillusioned. And um, anyway, Wing of Manone brought him along to this session, and he said nobody seemed to be very happy about him being there. He looked uh, kind of sloppy, he said. He was sloppy that day. 
And, um, well, um, Morton plays uh, quite quite decent solo on this number, uh, one of his sort of flamboyant solos, but it does sound quite out of date. His, his raggy style sounds a bit dated alongside all these swing guys, and uh, even manages to get the chords wrong. Uh, although you probably won't notice, because he, he's, it's a very sort of compelling line he plays. But uh, on closer inspection, he's not actually playing the written changes. Uh, he solos on the middle eight, uh, etc. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's, it's like a string of solos, but uh, unlike that Walton Crawley record where um, he, it, Morton would be in control and he'd add all kinds of nice little touches behind, but nothing like that happens on this record. So it's a bit of a curious egg, but it's a rather nice tune, I think. It's called I'm Alone Without You. Richard Pite at the drums and the rock <laughs> Very obscure Malcolm Sked. <laughs> Our fine guitar player, Jakob Olberger. <laughs> We're on the front line now, doing sterling work there at the end on trombone, Graham Hughes. He's been Paul Marys, Johnny Dunn, and uh, Wingy Minow, and, and Et Al, and whoever Al was. Duke Heiker. And a wonderful clone player, Matthias Seuper. And uh, thanks to Stefan Jolot for his wonderful playing. 
Stefano. The man of the moment, Michael McQuay. Okay, so we're going to uh, finish with uh, uh, Morton's paean of self-praise, Mr. Jelly Lord, and uh, and uh, if you're if you're thumbing through your copies of Brian Rust's discography and wondering why he lists three saxophones and we've only got two, um, well, he was wrong. Recent research has revealed <laughs> that uh, Jack Pettis, who was the soprano sax player in the band, had already left before this session was recorded. Uh, to join Ben Burney's band in New York. I'm indebted to Michael for uh, pointing me in the right direction. So, um, um, when you're transcribing these old uh, recordings, as my colleagues will testify, there, it's very difficult to sometimes get the notes out of the grooves. And uh, yes. so, you know, we could do without Brian Rust leading us up the garden path. <laughs> Thanks very much. So. Next year we can talk about the clarinet solos. Uh, yes, right. Yes, we will do. <laughs> Right, okay, um, so this is uh, uh, Mr. Jelly Lord.